Hello listeners, I'm Diana Todd Banks, host of Maturepreneurs Talk podcast. As you know, we have many diverse and different guests on this program and each have amazing stories to talk about. They're all people, all the guests are over 50, have done some extraordinary things in their life, have overcome some extraordinary challenges to survive, go on and do some amazing new things in their new half of life, their second chapter of life, or some say third chapter. So today's guest has more than enough stories in his second or third chapter to last, golly, I don't know how many lives, so many, there is some incredible stories to come so stay tuned listeners this will be a doozy so thank you and welcome mill temple hi diana greetings from uh, tupelo mississippi the birthplace of elvis presley yes that's right and elvis presley was one of my well the favorite of mine when i was growing up i had photographs all over my bedroom and ceiling of him so we have a we have a story here that uh, that we tell, and I was born on April 8th, 1948, yeah. in a little hospital here in Tupelo, and just uh, three or four months after I was born, Bernie and Gladys packed up little Elvis and moved to Memphis. They decided Tupelo just wasn't big enough to hold both of us. <laughs> oh, golly. Yes, it's, it's a very small city, town. Tupelo? It used to be. It's uh, grown quite a bit now, and uh, it's kind of a hub, and a lot of people come in here during the daytime and, and leave, so our numbers uh, swell during the daytime. And uh, 1956, uh, when I was eight, uh, my mother uh, started all this uh, lifelong uh, love of Elvis and his music. She took me to see him at the big Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show here, and I was a little rockabilly from that day on. <laughs> oh, how gorgeous. Yes, right in the heart of hillbilly country. Gee. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful country here. Yes, I've, I've actually been through it. I didn't have time to stay there. I was on the way to a classical guitar conference in Mobile, Alabama. Oh. <laughs> Spring Hill College. Anyway, let's talk about you. Now, Mel, golly, where does one start with your life? When I was reading some notes about you, I couldn't work out whether this was real or whether, mm -hmm. whether it was part of your four books that have been published, and there's a fifth one on the way. But you wrote to me about Merle was held by hostage, held hostage by drug dealers. Hitmen tried to kill him. And he, tr he and his team were ambushed by a sniper on a day of dramatic intervention by God. Is that part of the story or is that part of your story? Well, uh, as one uh, newspaper wrote, it's hard to tell where uh, Merle ends and Michael begins, the character based on me in the books. But uh, all of that was true. All that happened to me and uh, much, much more. And it's great fodder. Uh, for a novelist in his old age. Oh, yes. Yes, and a novelist, big time. Because you go on to say, after investigating a corrupt governor, he was forced to leave law enforcement by for the corporate world and politics, but learned that the gangsters who tried to kill him were just choir boys compared to the political criminals who used the full power of the state to crush their enemies. Oh, that's a lot of intrigue there. Lots of yeah, stuff. What I call the uh, what I call the unholy trinity of politics, crime, and business. <laughs> yeah. Yes. They, uh, so the gangsters uh, who tried to kill me, uh, they just uh, kind of were warming me up to uh, to uh, go to go to the next level. I guess that uh, people don't realize. Um, you know, the level of corruption that exists in government uh, and uh, what what people will go to, what lengths they will go to, to protect uh, power and money that they have. And uh, and uh, they will uh, seek the, uh, you know, the agents of the government uh, on you 
in order to um, mute you and eliminate you and and shut you up. Yeah, and you were weren't about to be shut up because you were you must have been doing pretty well. You were in law enforcement, uh, and that must have been quite quite an experience. And and that was in Mississippi. Yes, I left. Um, well, I interned with a deputy sheriff in the book I think you've been reading, a deputy. And uh, when I was about to leave Ole Miss, and when I graduated, I went into the first drug wars uh, for the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics, um, brand new agency modeled after the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. And uh, there weren't many of us. And uh, I got the call, and I thought that must be the place for me. I was young and naive and uh, uh, wanted to slay dragons and rescue damsels in distress and <laughs> thought the world was a nice and neat and ordered place and I found out that was not true and uh, danger was all around and uh, people were all around who wore masks and sometimes the people who were supposed to be your allies uh, turned out to be your worst enemies. Oh golly, gosh. And so you were in a very high profile political case. Yeah, later on when I left uh, law enforcement, I left law enforcement because I investigated uh, someone who the governor had appointed illegally to our agency. And uh, he, um, he liked to uh, abuse young girls. And they tried to cover it up, and I investigated it. And they had to fire him, and uh, they didn't like it. And they came after me. And then I went into the corporate world, and still wanting to save the world, I got into uh, a lot of political campaigns, trying to vote for people who I thought were had a reformers, <laughs> trying to do the right thing. And, and uh, that got me into some trouble with some powerful people. And then I got appointed to a uh, to a uh, state agency and uh, wanted to slay dragons one last time and didn't realize the dragons there were bigger and nastier than any I'd ever faced. And they were waiting to gobble me up. And it uh, turned out the treachery and betrayal went all the way to the White House and here in America. And um, and they they also came after me and. Uh, <laughs> I had to go to prison for a while, but there were good things that happened there in prison too, believe it or not. Yes. It was a terrible, terrible ordeal, terrible ordeal. Um, I, I didn't know days that I could make it and my life was threatened and there were corrupt uh, officials in the prison system. Uh, but I wound up starting what we believe is the most successful um, inmate-led uh, Christian ministry in the history of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And, and now... Uh, those same prisons uh, used my books and invited me back uh, to speak. That's a wonderful accolade. Now, what, um, what was it? What was the catalyst that uh, caused you to lead a ministry? How did that happen? Well, uh, when the world fell on me, um, and I found out, you, I tell you, you, I think you probably your listeners may already know this, but uh, when you when uh, you get in trouble or when people think you can no longer do anything for them, you no longer have the power or or influence or whatever they think you had, you find out who your friends really are. Yeah. And most of them will abandon you. Sad yeah. to say. So most true. of them run for the tall grass when the bullets start flying and. That happened with me, and um, so I was uh, pretty much alone, and uh, and had uh, refused to um, to uh, lie like some people in government wanted me to, and so so I couldn't testify. They locked me up in a dungeon, and oh. uh, it, it was really a dungeon. Uh, but uh, but uh, God broke me there, and uh, and changed my life there and uh, the purpose for it all began to be revealed to me and uh, uh, miracles began to happen 
And uh, then I thought back to the days I was saved time and again against all odds when the drug dealers had held me hostage uh, while they debated in front of me where to bury my body at midnight. Uh, and they actually ate razor blades and swallowed them, bled out, <laughs> swallowed, oh, swallowed fire. Uh, I was lured out to be assassinated by by contract killers hired by organized crime and I always got out of these things and then one day when I was promoted and I eventually became the first captain in the agency uh, we were doing a heroin deal and uh, with some heroin dealers and we've been my man had been buying from them they were trying to create an attic market around two universities and uh, so we set up a, a deal for a large amount of of drugs to try to draw out their backers and we were going to arrest them in the middle of the deal and uh, when i was going to meet my agents uh, always running late <laughs> still do that uh, crank my car to go meet them and set up the parameters of the deal and um, when i put my hand on the gear shift uh, the spirit filled up my car wrapped all around me all through me i never experienced anything like that in my life I was a very nominal Christian in those days and uh, uh, spoke to me clearly and said, go back and get the bulletproof vest. And then it was gone. And I said, what is that? I'm losing my mind. And they just didn't like to wear the vest. No one wore them back then. All police do now. But we, no one did then. We only had two for that part of the state. And uh, they were very lightweight, had no armor in them. And uh, might stop a small handgun and I said, well, I'm losing my mind. I put my hand back on a gear shift and uh, spirit filled up my car again. It wasn't optional. I said, okay, okay. And I met the agents uh, after I got the bulletproof vest, asked them to wear them. They didn't want to. I knew something was about to happen. And I told them to try to keep the deal downtown where we'd have buildings to hide behind. And uh, so we could stay close to them on surveillance. And, but it got away from them. They went out in the country on a high levee road leading off into the swamp. And there was a railroad running through um, the swamp. And uh, where it intersected with the levee road, uh, there was a high railroad trestle to lift up the track. And just where it intersected, there was a clump of pine trees. And that's where they had the sniper. Uh -huh. He was perched up with a high powered rifle and in the midst of the deal. He uh, opened fire, and it was a terrible gun battle that day. And uh, readers could read all about it, and it goes to Shade of Pale, uh, <laughs> where it's fictionalized. But, uh, but when, I, when the gun battle was ended and I was in the hospital, standing next to my friend who had been hit three times, a doctor uh, uh, had cut his clothes off of him, and the white bulletproof back to get was now crimson soaked in blood. And the doctor had his hands up in the entry room and he said, look at this, Merle. He said, one hit him in the lower extremities, one sliced through his right arm. This one struck him right in the chest. He said, uh, it penetrated the vest because it wasn't designed to stop a high-powered rifle, but it deflected it. And it went in behind his right breast, skittered around the barrel of his rib cage, and popped out behind his left breast. And he looked at me and he said, Merle, if he hadn't had that vest on, it had taken out his heart and lungs and he'd have been dead before he hit the ground. Right now, I have chill bumps oh. down to my toe. I still do. It's 40, uh, 42 years ago, but I still get chill bumps every time I tell it. And that day, you could hear the hear the murmur and feel the shuffle of angels' feet around us in that room. And that man lives and walks the planet still today because uh, God sent me back to get that vest. Wow, what a story. Now, that was a true story, right? That's a true story, yeah. Yeah, and that's a true story, listeners. That's not fiction. So you did write about that in in one of your books, as you said. I think it was A Ghostly Shade of Pale. Is that correct? That's right. Michael in the books is based on me. And uh, there is some fiction in my books, you know, fictional devices, you know, used to um, help tell a good story and make it flow. But... Uh, you know, uh, there's a great deal of truth in my books based on, on memory. And uh, we changed the names, uh, you know, protect the innocent and the guilty. And uh, <laughs> you keep me from being sued early on. But most of the people who would have cared, uh, they're gone now. 
either by age um, or due to the lifestyles they led, which uh, caused them some of them to be killed, assassinated, you know, early on. And and there's still some corrupt politicians around who don't who don't <laughs> care for me too much. I wish I would shut up, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so you know they don't they don't I don't fear them. I don't fear anybody. Oh, well done. And as you're talking, you've got this big smile on your face. So it must be quite amusing to look back on that time of your life. Do you feel at times as though that was a movie? Yeah, I do. I had no idea in those days either that I would uh, ever write about it. Uh, you know, there were just things that were happening and uh, uh, people said, well, you must have kept really good notes. I said, no, it's all, all, of, all of this is in my head and uh, got a good memory. Thank goodness. Thanks to the Lord. And, and, um, but I never dreamed that I would ever write about it, but I began to write throughout my life and uh, I'd write uh, op-ed pieces and uh, political speeches and technical papers and what not, and people would always tell me, well, you have a gift. You should try the great American novel. <laughs> and then so, so in my 60s, uh, you know, I decided um, to to try that, and I found out it was pretty hard. To, it's totally different than anything I'd ever done to uh, write a big story, a big complicated story with a lot of threads, and uh, to make uh, all those threads and all those characters uh, come home in the end with integrity and harmony of the story and the characters and not have them saying something on page 400 they wouldn't have said on page two or three. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, when I finished my first, first, first draft of the book, I looked at it and I thought, well, this is the worst thing anybody's ever written. And it's flat and lifeless. And then, and then I saw what I needed to do after I'd set the book aside. I went back from start to finish, and I began to go into each scene and add descriptors. And uh, when I did, the characters began to pop up off the page, pages and began to live and breathe, and you could see what they saw, hear what they heard, and feel what they felt. And uh, if we have one thread in most of our book reviews, it is that uh, his books are so visual. Mm -hmm. And we have um, special ed teachers a lot of teachers use my books in English and history classes, but we also have special ed teachers who use my books because it helps their students uh, to associate words with the pictures I'm painting with my words. And that just uh, thrills me to no end. Oh, gosh, yes. So uh, people with disabilities or? Yeah, just in special ed classes in high school and middle school and maybe they're um, uh, they have, you know, it's a catch-all phrase, but, you know, some of them may be dyslexic or, or, or have any, a number of other things that, that cause them difficulty when they're reading something and trying to comprehend it. And, uh, and we've just had, um, uh, so many folks and down in Mobile where you were headed, I think you told me earlier, Yeah. Uh, there was a in Mobile using them and, and her special ed class and and when when uh, they would see the picture uh, that I was painting of uh, being in the woods at night at midnight and and uh, the owls and the uh, hooting, hooting from the upper terraces of the trees and the creatures night creatures moving through through the forest and the limbs of the trees scraping the roof of my car so that began, they began to see it. And then in the picture in their mind, they would associate that with the words on the page. Yeah. And I'm probably doing it injustice to my, my teacher friends, but it's, that's what kind of what they would tell me. And, uh, and it just made, uh, made me realize I knew, you know, just how important it is when we write things and we never know who's going to read, read the books and, and how it's going to impact their lives. And we get uh, cards and letters from and emails from people um, from all over the world, really, who have found the books and uh, write to tell me that they've uh, changed their lives. 
never that they didn't know anybody else ever felt that way uh but you know but then i'm about something i wrote about when i when michael i was being challenged in the world and uh you know it's just sometimes uh diana the uh the the, the notes i get are so tender i'm not ashamed to admit it i, I sit at my computer when i get them and uh, i cry mm, yeah i i can understand that actually um I'm certainly moved by words. Yes, descriptive words, painting word pictures, just really bring a story out. And that just came to you, that you hadn't read that anywhere. You just knew that that's what you had to do to your books. Yeah, I think I was, uh, I think uh, the Holy Spirit was leading me. Yeah. And he was working his will on me during that time. Uh, uh, especially in prison, and and every time I thought I couldn't make it, uh, they would show me what a difference I was making, and and that there were good things waiting for me, and uh, to hold on, and I did, and he kind of showed me and guided me, and uh, uh, he's opened doors that everybody told me could never be opened for me, and you know, and uh, and then Criminal Minds and the famous and popular TV show it's been on 13 years in America and syndicated all around the world uh, they read The Ghost of Shade of Pale and called me to Hollywood said they wanted to represent me so I loaded up and uh, like the Beverly Hillbillies I went to Beverly <laughs> you drove and, there uh, I drove there yeah, yeah and, good and, on you. Uh, not in a pickup in, truck no no in my <laughs> Nissan and okay. uh, so we uh, went out, spent about two and a half weeks there, and um, it was quite an adventure. I wouldn't want to live out there. Uh, and uh, I will say in Hollywood, they, uh, they didn't know quite what to make of me uh, because, um, uh, you know, my they kind of have a formula in Hollywood, uh, especially in movies. I like to have a lot of naked people cursing, crashing into things. <laughs> And my books don't have that. My books will scare you. Because the things that happen to me are very scary. Yeah. Uh, and very moving. But uh, I refused to do what the industry wanted me to do. And they wanted me to uh, put neon in my book and layer it up with neon. And I said, how do you find neon? And and uh, so they sent me some of my writing back. This is not the movie industry, but the book industry. And... Uh, they just sprinkle the worst profanity you can imagine throughout my writing. And I said, no, no, I can't do that. I won't do that. It's not necessary. It's a crutch. Uh, when you, maybe you can't, you know, write too well, you throw in a, you know, a favorite uh, four letter word here yeah. and there. I said, but I'm, uh, I said, everything that we write today is like epitaphs on our tombstone. Uh -huh. And I said, maybe you choose to be remembered for that. I just choose not to, and and I take it as a very great uh, uh, responsibility to know that kids are reading my books, and I wanted to write books, you know, that uh, if my mother and my English teacher were still living, I wouldn't be ashamed yeah. for them to read my books, and uh, believe me, I don't think uh, my books, and most readers would tell you, uh, you know, curse words would not enhance the, uh, uh, the drama and the mystery and the tension at all in my books. Matter of fact, I think they would probably tell you it would detract from it. And and I've had authors write me and say, tell me how you don't do that. I don't want to do that. Tell me how you do that. And then I give them, give them some tips, a way to skirt it and and uh, to paint pictures so they, they won't have to do that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but we, uh, we're under contract in Hollywood now. They've been pitching it for a TV series, and so we'll see uh, what happens. But uh, whatever happens, it's been uh, uh, more than I could ever hope for, and I've met and made friends with so many people, yeah. uh, famous, famous and not famous, and uh, and uh, you know uh, we've spoken here and there and everywhere, and uh, uh, people bring their uh, kids to meet me and. <laughs> it's an awesome responsibility and it's uh, awesome yes. time to be 70 years old. Really? You'll be 70? I'm 70 years old. 
Oh, you certainly don't look it, and I mean that sincerely. You're my new best. You're my new best friend. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to be too. Um, Mel, I was going to ask you a question. You were talking about the tips that you were offering some writers, or did I misjudge you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was just saying. I I give a little uh, tip sometimes. I'll use if I if I want to. Uh, to, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, you know, I'll say, well, um, Michael uh, was around a group of men and or whoever, undercover or prison or wherever. And he said, well, they, uh, he thought they uh, really must like their mothers because they talk about her all the time. Uh, and so it's a back, back door away, and then the people go, "Oh, I get it," you know. I know what they're saying, <laughs> and uh, you know there are things like that you can do, and uh, and uh, you know it's uh, uh, some guy in England uh, where I was on a, in a group talking about writing and editing, and uh, he said, "Well, it's um, he said it's absolutely essential to use the language of the street." He said, I just finished editing a big, gritty crime drama. And he said, it's absolutely essential to use those words. I said, well, I just finished writing a big, gritty crime drama. And uh, people at Criminal Minds, you know, adopted it, invited me out there to sign books for their cast. It's <laughs> not really, you know. And uh, But, you know, to each to their own. But, uh, you know, that's just not something I'm going to do. And when I got to Hollywood... And Hollywood found out that I actually had core values that I wouldn't barter away to the highest bidder. Uh, they looked at me like Scotty had just beamed me down from the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> oh, dear. But I think your quiet but a little bit wicked sense of humour <laughs> uh, enables you to see and do a lot and say a lot in your words and writing, because I could pick that up from watching you. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, probably, I played guilty. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. That's good. Hey, Merle, um, where can people get your books? Well, over there, uh, and I have, I have a lot of friends over there, too, and uh, some of them said they were waiting for this interview. Um, and uh, I would say probably where you can uh, get the e-books, um, probably at Amazon. Yeah. Uh, that'd probably be how most readers, uh, just got a note from a man. He's in, uh, he's a missionary in Nigeria. He's been there for a long time and he lived among, among people who just don't have hardly anything. And, and I just got a note from him saying he'd read all of my books, uh, on ebook and, uh, thank me for putting so much thought and time into them to make the, make them the books they are. So probably ebooks, and uh, uh, they could always contact me. Uh, they can look at them on Amazon and and do that. And, uh, and we could probably ship some actually hardcovers there, but uh, the mailing. Oh would be, no, uh, no, no, no! Don't don't mail. Yeah. The mailing would be prohibitive. No, it's yeah, better. Do about, you yeah. have any of them on Kindle? Yeah, they're all on Kindle and and uh, all on Nook also. Okay. All right. Well, I'll make sure. Kindle, yes, because Kindle enables people to access books very easily. No, that's that's really good. Yes, I'm hoping a lot of people will do that and a lot of people will see this uh, uh, interview and then uh, and then you'll ring me up one day and say, Merle, the strangest things happen. You're now famous in Australia. You need to come here. Yeah. Oh, how wonderful that would be. Yes. We'll have to see what we can do about that one. Uh, <laughs> oh, golly, yes. Oh, you've never been to Australia. No, I haven't. I'd, I'd love to. Yes. Goodness. Well, you know, we'll have to rally forth the troops here in Australia and get them to, all eager and enthused and getting you out here, that yeah. would be wonderful. I would say too, uh, before I forget that uh, anybody who hears it, or in case you, you're aware, uh, if there are any uh, book clubs there, sometimes I, I'm interviewed 
uh, via Skype or Google Hangout or something by book clubs. Okay. I'll go go there and uh, they'll be reading my books and I started going to them like I do local book clubs here in the States. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I will uh, interview with them and talk about my life and the books and all I've seen. And, um, you know, it's just uh, I've seen and done so much. And uh, I lay it all out. I don't sugarcoat it. Uh, the good, the bad, and the tragic. Um, and um, but it's been uh, it's been quite a life. Uh, I don't think uh, God's quite done with me yet. I hope. And uh, and uh, the new book, uh, Blood on the Ground, will be coming out probably around the first of November. I'm really proud of it. I think it's going to be special. I hope. And uh, we just met so many people uh, who who we stay in contact with now via social media and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, it's just, um, uh, so many things have happened to me. People say I'm like Forrest Gump. <laughs> I've been everywhere, <laughs> seen everything, met everybody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's been, uh, quite a journey and most of it, most unexpected. Yes. My goodness. How long were you in prison? I was there five and a half years. Oh, goodness. In a dungeon yeah, the entire time? Yeah, they were, they were, um, uh, they were very harsh to me because um, I went against them. And uh, when they wanted me to tell things I didn't think were true. Yeah. I, I agreed to cooperate. And uh, they decided to make an example out of me. And they sure did. But, um, but, you know, as hard as it was, and it was extremely hard, I... Uh, most people who read The Redeemed, the final book in the series, uh, time-wise, um, uh, most people write me tell me they've never cried so hard in their life. Yeah, and uh, it was gut-wrenching to write the book and remember it all because I was threatened, uh, yeah. with, threatened with rape, um, you know, and uh, there was just so much corruption there between the gangs and some of the people in the institutions. And when I met some really nice people there, too, those some who became lifelong friends and uh, uh, some who still contact me. One, uh, one man who was uh, connected to a mafia family, um, I talked him out of killing himself one night after I'd come home. Uh, he talked to me, I talked to him via private message and he called to tell me he was gonna kill himself. and and. Uh, he uh, and we were thankfully we were able, able to talk him out of it, and he's still living and trying to lead a good life. And and in prison, I had convinced him to come to church with me, and uh, so we still hear from a lot of people. And uh, you know, many of them have uh, blessed my life. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Do you have an actual ministry outside of prison? Oh, I do. Yeah. My books are really my ministry. Yes. And I, tra I travel and I speak and I tell uh, my story of yeah. uh, second chances and redemption and uh, and about the story I, and the, I was commissioned to tell all the books I was commissioned to write. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I have some upcoming. I speak to the big academies of West Memphis, Arkansas in about two weeks and then to a big wild game dinner at a at a church and um so i speak in civic clubs schools all the time and uh, yeah. you love I go it into i go into prisons and shelters and we're down near hattiesburg mississippi we were in a i spoke at a big um a huge gathering there seven eight hundred people and and uh i it, uh, wasn't feeling well that night and battling some thyroid and autoimmune problems and i was having a bad time that night and uh was up on a high podium and kind of kind of shaky. And uh, but when I began to talk, uh, it was a big wild game dinner there too. And um, and uh, I don't even hardly remember what I said. And I was exhausted when I finished. I said thank you, and I turned to my left, and the organizers were bounding up the stage to my left, hands outstretched, smiling from ear to ear, grabbed my hand and said. We've never seen anything like that. And then I got the nudge and I turned and looked to my right toward the audience. 
and all those people were standing to their feet and they told me in 20 years they had never seen anything like that ah. there was that had happened before and i couldn't even get to my wife on the far side where the book table was on the far side of the big life center and because people were crushing up the stage and bringing their children up uh to meet me and uh but it wasn't me it was all god working through me and and uh but things happen like that out there and uh I've kind of grown to accept them and not be surprised. And yeah. people come up to me sometimes, you know, this day's look on their face in bookstores and stuff. And like somebody's hit them upside the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> and, and they say, I, uh, I, you know, I, I think God just told me I'm supposed to help you. I said, oh, it's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> and then they'll get us into schools and, and into local media and, and uh, then the, the story just goes on and on and on. Yeah. and uh, so well, um, You do such a lot of good, and I, I love it. I love speaking with you. I'm going to be, I would like to do another conversation with you, only this time we'll do it for YouTube. And that'd, be so, great. that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. But in the meantime, we will get it out onto all the podcast platforms and let it be known that you're there. So, Mel, gosh, the, aside from going to the various bookstores and online and offline um, in the United States, your books, your four books, listeners, one is Deputy, Once Upon a Time in Mississippi, the other is A Ghostly Shade of Pale, another A Rented World, and the fourth one, The Redeemed, A Leap of Faith. And his fifth book, as Merle said earlier, Blood on the Ground, will be released in November. So that's another one to really look forward to. Ah, oh, my goodness me, you've turned the cards around quite a lot. Thank you so much for coming on the program, Will. It's been an absolute delight to speak with you and see oh, the wicked, word, and see this wicked look on your face all the time. It's just wicked look. It's just so charming. Um, it's wonderful. It makes me have a big smile. Uh, so, Mel, thank you once again. Listeners, I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation our comfortable conversations and until next time this is diana todd banks thanking you again merle temple for coming on the program thanking you listeners and again until next time goodbye for now goodbye merle